Good morning, and welcome to today's webcast, Modern Approaches for Equity to Payroll Reconciliation. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome, and thank you for viewing our webcast series. Before we begin, please keep the following in mind. You can customize how you view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top right of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons that relate to a different aspect of our session. You can download a PDF of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget. You can ask questions by typing in the Q&A window and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. This presentation is not legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. All right, and with that, I'll turn it over to our presenters to get us started. Great. Thanks, Chad. My name is Matt McKittrick. I'm a partner here at Moss Adams, and we're really glad you're all here. Uh, I have been in the stock-based compensation world since 2005, and I really loved the journey. Never looked back when I had my first project on Feds 123R, and uh, I've, I've really appreciated my latest bit of work at Moss Adams, where we help companies address and understand their payroll and equity-related challenges and assess those challenges, and then we often work with them to uh, build advanced technological solutions to help automate those challenges and reduce the manual efforts and pain points associated with it. I also work closely with Jolene, uh, a CEP, one of our team members. Jolene, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Jolene Lawson, and yes, I'm a CEP, as well as a consulting senior here at Moss Adams. I graduated from UW with an industrial and systems engineering background. So I'm really interested in processes and how to improve those processes, especially through technology and automation. Thanks. Great. So just a little bit about Moss Adams. I think many of you know our firm, but we are a, a large public accounting, tax, and consulting advisory firm. We uh, have over uh, 4,700 individuals working in our firm, more than 30 locations. We actually are worldwide through our proxy relationship. And interestingly, we've been in business almost 110 years, uh, headquartered here in Seattle. Uh, a little bit more about our business in terms of the group that both Jolene and I work in, our business solutions group. We have about 50 professionals in this group, and we focus pretty exclusively on solving equity, uh, 401k and retirement, and other HR and related benefit challenges. We've uh, dedicated a lot of our training and development budget to making sure we have competent certified equity professionals and equity compensation associates on staff. We have seven CEPs and nine ECAs on our staff. We really love business process assessments. And as I illustrated earlier, we, we focus on automating those and providing analytic solutions and building custom software sometimes to address those challenges that companies have. We've been honored and quite fortunate to work with four of the Magnificent Seven over the two and a half decades of uh, services that we've been providing. And um, in fact, we've actually been recognized nine times by those companies uh, to in, in the GEO Awards, which is a global equity organization. It's, it's a world organization that uh, specializes in equity compensation. Uh, we actually have uh, a list of those awards here. Uh, in 2024, this last year, we we're actually recognized by both Amazon and Domo for best use of technology. Uh, Domo's a company less than 10,000 employees. Amazon has more than 200,000. So we're quite adept at handling challenges of uh, small to mid-sized companies and going all the way up to the largest world-class companies like Amazon and NVIDIA here, and you can see Microsoft as well. Um, let's see, we'll talk quickly about the agenda. Um, you know, we're gonna focus in on the importance of reconciliations. It's really interesting these days with the T plus one regulation coming in line. Uh, these reconciliations become even more important because the time to get the stock issued to the employee has been condensed from two days to one day. And if, you know, that just tightens the timeline, uh, the likelihood of errors increases. And so the importance of reconciliations comes with that. Uh, we will focus on uh, three, generally three approaches and talk about those solutions. We'll actually have a nice demo that Jolene will give related to 
uh, one of the leading examples out there, some, some purpose-built software, so you can see some of this stuff happening, some of the latest and greatest, and um, that's our agenda. So first off, uh, the importance of reconciliations. Uh, um, I think we all know recons are generally designed to make sure we have complete and accurate record keeping and reporting. Uh, when it comes to payroll and equity solutions, it's, it's super critical to make sure the tax withholding is correct as well. Uh, we've seen over our time many W-2Cs, these are corrections to employee W-2s happening because reconciliations weren't performed in a timely basis. In fact, they weren't even detected as issues until after the first set of W-2s were released and then suddenly there's a W-2C correction needed. These all are quite painful for employees and corporations to deal with. So. Uh, there, there's severe consequences to not having complete and accurate records, especially on the tax side. Um, some other important items, uh, making sure that the payroll and broker and HR systems are all synchronized with all these vendors. I mean, most companies end up having multiple vendors supporting them from their HR systems like Workday to their payroll systems like ADP to their broker systems. You know, there are a number of large brokers out there that work with them. Having all three of those systems closely integrated and synced is really important and pretty hard to do when they're all passing data between each other independently. Uh, and so that's that's one of the things that a good reconciliation process ensures that, that that data is making it across completely and accurately. And then one item that we really like to focus in on, especially for large companies that really have to operate at scale is that when errors occur, the likelihood of one occurring, it means there's probably many can occur as well. And so being able to identify and find where the errors are happening, likely in source systems, somewhere upstream, source processes is really important. So having a good reconciliation process allows uh, the reviewers and teams to identify the sources and trace them back to the origination point and, and, and fix them so that they don't happen and companies can grow and scale. Uh, let's see. So, um, yeah, and then finally, uh, just kind of highlight again, T plus one on this front, uh, even more important with T plus one coming online at the end of May here, uh, just a few uh, weeks away, uh, you have to push the shares to the employee within 24 hours. And so there's very little time to detect um, and make sure those things are complete and accurate. And so it's likely you'll be pushing those shares right away. And uh, the reconciliations may be um, either delayed, especially if you're using manual processes to do recons. So uh, we think it's a very timely topic with T plus one going on online soon to make sure these uh, these um, reconciliations are done in a timely fashion, especially with T plus one here hitting right away. Okay, so we'll talk now about IRS uh, next day rules. So yeah, kind of recentering back on the tax issues. I think probably many of you know that the IRS levies fines when you have a late uh, um, deposit, and uh, especially there, there's a special rule here where if you have $100,000 or more of obligation, it's due within 24 hours. And when you think about a large equity vesting event, uh, especially for broad-based plans or large executive plans, uh, it, it can quite easily, the tax obligations for the employees uh, can easily exceed $100,000. So that the, any, any amounts due that are greater than 100,000 have to be deposited with the IRS within 24 hours. And the consequences of not doing that are quite significant. Uh, it, this, this still shocks me to this day. If, if you're 15 days late or more with that deposit, uh, and, and this could include under deposits because your reconciliation was failing or you, you had incomplete records, you, you actually owe 10% of that deposit as a, uh, a fine. And so if you can imagine there's a million dollars worth of tax withholdings due, uh, if you're 15 days late on that deposit, you also owe $100,000 more. Uh, so that uh, it gets unwieldy quickly and it often justifies investing the right amount of time and assessing your processes and in particular making sure they're complete and accurate so you don't have late payments going to the IRS. And I have many anecdotes of stories where these delays have happened and uh, frankly millions of dollars in late fees have been assessed. So th these are real and they happen even today. Um, yeah, and there's one more highlight that T plus one just continues to uh, force these deposits to happen even sooner. but. Um, you know, to the employee side and, and errors if they happen uh, will create challenges. Okay, so uh, the next slide here is more uh, kind of relating to what we're talking about today. And um, we like to visualize and we do process assessments. This is an example of um, the multiple points of uh, recons that happen in an equity payroll HR 
uh, treasury, transfer agent, HR system, and comp committee type of life cycle here. You can see all these various boxes are the various stakeholders in an equity life cycle. Uh, the payroll and equity systems in the middle with the green oval around it, those really are what we're focused on today. But uh, as many of you, if you're in this space are aware, there are recon points. You know, I think I have counted 11 separate reconciliation points on this slide between HR systems, transfer agents, all your international payroll and treasury groups, and even new awards and comp committees. So, um, uh, and at the top, the uh, third party tax service providers uh, that often handle mobile employee tax payments and management. So many, many recon points here. We're only gonna focus in on the payroll and equity record keeping recon points, which are uh, a subset of those 11. Um, and I'll turn over now to uh, Jolene, who's gonna talk a little bit about some of the reconciliation fields that we address and, and or that, that are typically addressed. Go ahead, Jolene. Thanks, Matt. The high impact fields that we have on this screen here, it, what we've seen is that they're all interplaying with each other, right? Especially with year to date compensation and the thresholds that may or may not be hit depends or leads to the type of taxation that we are withholding from, from the participant. And we wanna make sure that we're not over or under withholding those taxes, especially for example, social security, that threshold of 168,000 year to date wages. We are trying to keep track of that as well as the taxes that are being paid uh, federally and all of that. So these are really high impact fields. And on this next slide, we also have seen additional impacted fields when it comes to state to state movers or international movers. Mobility taxation is a beast. I think we all have our own stories about mobility taxation. And it's important that we are reconciling between the two systems, especially when maybe the broker system is calculating a subset of taxes, whereas the payroll system is calculating a different subset and they're transferring information back and forth. So how are we ensuring that those, tax those taxes are being reported correctly, but also tracked in each of those systems. We've talked about the importance of reconciliation and I will hand it back off to Matt to talk about the approaches and solutions to that. Thanks, Julie. So right, as we talked earlier, uh, we're gonna highlight multiple levels of approach. And you know, I wanna, you know, as an advisor to clients, um, there's no one correct level here there each one is basically depends on the client situation and circumstances uh, level one obviously spreadsheets are very powerful many many people use them even at the largest companies out there are using spreadsheets today to manage these reconciliations incredibly powerful tool we'll talk about that um, there are other options including uh, scripting you can actually automate through macros and vba script spreadsheets but you, there are also tools like Python, R, and Alteryx that are more data science uh, and processing tools that are out there that can also be used. And so we'll focus in on how the scripting tools are streamlining, especially a lot of the manual and highly repeatable processes of spreadsheets and preparing something that maybe looks like a spreadsheet and feels like a spreadsheet, but you don't have all the manual prep time to get the spreadsheet loaded. It does a lot of the heavy lifting in the back end. And then finally, and we're really excited about this, uh, there, there's this purpose-built application. We spend a lot of time helping clients that have complex challenges uh, by building purpose-built applications for them. Um, we really spend a lot of time defining the requirements of that particular client and building a specific application to handle their unique needs. And of course they do, obviously that's a cost that comes with that, but um, often clients realize significant long-term ROI because they built the package that handles most of their needs uh, and automates them so that their people can be highly effective doing other things besides pushing spreadsheets around. So we'll move on now to uh, a spreadsheet example. And um, this, this is a pretty generic example, but I'm gonna let uh, Jolene highlight some of the, the features of it. And of course, as we go through these, we'll talk about pros and cons of each. And, uh, and, and when we wrap this up, uh, we'll kind of circle back on you as, as a company helping think through which one might be right for you. Take it away, Julie. 
Right, thanks, Matt. Spreadsheet recons, I love my spreadsheet recons. I think we all do because it is so familiar to us. There's lots of fast training and it's a low, a low cost. If you're using Excel or Google Sheets, that just comes with your suite. And with the cons of spreadsheets, it mainly revolves around just high, how highly manual they are. I definitely get frustrated when I have my spreadsheet filtered and I want to copy a formula all the way down and then I unfilter and I think, oh shoot, I had it filtered so my formula isn't copied all the way down. Things like that lead to some processing issues that usually we're able to catch, but because it is so highly manual that there is a high risk of errors or for example, if a new file definition comes in, maybe the broker side added a new column and I'm used to creating a formula that is A minus B, but now I have to do A minus C. Things like that we might catch up front, but we might not catch up front. And that's why we do have many review sessions with various teams, which is great. But just in case those errors don't get caught, that's something that we have to be mindful of. Some other section of cons that we have here are talking about business rules. The idea of if I have, if for myself, if I'm a highly specialized certified person, I will know all of the business rules that we're looking at, which columns make sense to put in the recon, which ones don't. Uh, but even then I might not have a fully comprehensive idea of what other columns that we should be looking at or what other, other fields that we should be looking at. And if I were to leave the company, then what happens? So we don't want to rely on just somebody who is very specialized in one area in this one spreadsheet, right? Data processing limitations as well. If we're a larger company that has millions upon millions of transactions, Excel or Google Sheets might not have the processing capabilities there. And then our last point here, we talk about opportunity costs. There's a lot of manual time spent preparing these spreadsheets, which is great because we do get to see from the beginning state to end state what's occurring, but then that doesn't leave a lot of time on the back end for us to analyze with our payroll teams what's going on here and identifying those root causes of what needs to be fixed. So when we say opportunity costs here, it is great that we're using all of this time to make sure that everything is correct. But what happens on that back end when we don't get this spreadsheet out in time and then it might result in the W2s being incorrect and we have to go into W2Cs. Yeah, Julian, I just want to pipe in one item that I don't think is on here is just the heavy reliance on single individuals. Usually, you know, there's one person who owns the spreadsheet and processes it, and uh, if that person is on leave or not able to work that day, uh, you know, then some, someone else has to take it on. So just another uh, potential con there uh, with spreadsheet processing, although, you know, many companies deal with that pretty effectively, but just, just not on the con list there. Ready to go on to the next slide? Yeah, great call out. Great. Our so next think... exhibit here. Oh, sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah, it's you. Please. <laughs> Our next exhibit here, we're talking about payroll scripts in general. So to level set here, the idea behind a script is that when we're preparing our spreadsheets, we understand the logic that's going in there. So a script is supposed to replace that. That's why we have this automated reconciliation logic. You can have an R script there, a Python script there, um, any kind of reconciliation logic that will take in all the different files that we are recon reconciling, the payroll and broker, and then a reconciled report is spit out for the end users to then view and analyze and move forward with. We have an example here on this next slide. Up on top is a Excel output that the bottom portion, which is an R script snippet, outputs. And just like we would do in a spreadsheet, but this is built into a script, there's 
a portion of the script that will combine the two functions together. That's our, like our X lookups, for example. And we also have the calculations being prepped by the script. So the script here is supposed to do very like repeatable tasks in hopes that we don't end up seeing those errors of accidentally copying down the wrong formula, for example. So the pros and cons of a script pros, we can have outputs that are spreadsheets or maybe visualizations or something other that people are, might be asking for. We have repeatable results if the inputs are the same with that caveat, and it's closer to a push button solution. That script there, for example, ran in about 45 seconds, processing 20,000 rows versus we could do that in a spreadsheet as well, but it just might take a little bit more time. Other pros for a script is the flexibility for anyone who does have the skill set, and there's a relatively low cost in comparison to a custom solution. But then on the flip side for the cons, usually you would have to have a specialist that can edit the script, and that specialist might have to understand not only the business aspect, but also the technical aspect, unless you have teams working very closely with that specialist. There might be a subscription that costs a little bit more. R and Python are free to use for public, but there might be a subscription for Alteryx, for example. And then there might be limited functionality and scalability due to the specialist. They might just not have as much experience, or maybe there's a little bit more complexity that the R script won't be able to handle that Excel handles or somebody who knows the process very well, they'll be able to call that out. That limited functionality and scalability is reflected in the R script that way. So there are pros and cons to it, but some of us and our companies were asked to automate and automate now. And this is a really great solution to that if that's what you're being asked to do. Yeah, I would expect, Jolene, that many of the attendees on this call are getting mandates from their senior leadership or the accounting team, CFO office, asking to streamline and automate as much as possible. And so, yeah, these scripts, even, even uh, spreadsheets with VBA and macros can be automation, right? So wherever there's a, a point in time where there's a human having to do 15 steps over and over again, to do the reconciliation, trying to strip that out through some form of scripting makes a lot of sense because that's just a place where the person is spending their time, a very valuable time, uh, doing something that's highly repeatable. And with the tools out there today, even advanced spreadsheets, uh, you can automate a lot of the manual steps. So I expect that many companies are embarking on, on these paths. And um, yeah, it, it probably makes sense for many companies to, to do that, to just strip out the, the manual processes. But now we're going to move on to uh, kind of the ultimate uh, approach to payroll and equity reconciliations. And this is where we're talking about a purpose-built solution where there's lots of design and thought put into it to meet the company's specific um, use cases and address the company's specific pain points and optimize it for their specific requirements. And you know, no, no one company is the same with these sorts of uh, process um, purpose-built solutions, but there are fundamentally uh, frameworks and, and components that are, can be leveraged over and over again. So we're quite, uh, we, we believe in this quite a bit. And so I wanted to show you uh, just a, a starting point uh, where we, we typically, whenever we go about building purpose-built type of solutions for companies, uh, it, it starts off with um, understanding the current state. And you'll remember this particular exhibit from the very beginning of the deck. We kind of highlighted uh, that we're focused on payroll and equity in the, in the middle there. Uh, you can see where um, you know, we've, we've highlighted their manual recon points all over this. So um, kind of recentering on where are the pain points in the process that companies face today. Every one of those manual recon points likely takes uh, you know, significant amounts of time. You know, a one-off spreadsheet and a set of four-eye review, you know, somebody prepares it, somebody reviews it. And so when you add up all the time to do that, it becomes quite significant. And we think it's really valuable to uh, 
spend some time conducting an assessment of your processes. So uh, when companies look at re-engineering their business processes, the, the best approach right off the bat is not just start addressing things, but really to understand where the pain points are and to prioritize the pain points in terms of level of, of effort to correct it and to think through it uh, holistically, document it, uh, define the pain points themselves and their risks and put it into a nice memo format because especially if um, you know, any business has to decide where to allocate resources and you know, they may not understand completely the kinds of pain and manual efforts that are involved. So conducting an assessment, documenting it, understanding the level of effort it takes to address those pain points every month and, and the potential risks like the IRS fines getting that all on paper so that it can be presented in a clean way upward to senior management who would be making decisions on where to invest in you know, correcting these challenges is a, is a very important first step. So we just continue to highlight how important these assessments are before you get going on any kind of re-engineering process. Um, you know, what happens once you assess where the pain points are, you usually, you know, especially with us, we go through a process of thinking what would the after state look like? So we know what the current state looks like if we were to redesign and make recommendations, uh, in this case, it was a highly complex client that was on a fast growth path and was very acquisitive. And so they really needed an advanced system. And we recommended that the after state include building a central control system that would manage the collection of the data from the various stakeholders and perform many of the reconciliations. So in the center here, you see this new box called the central control system. This is the purpose-built application. You can see that it's collecting on the left side year-to-date tax payment information from the payroll. This is one of the primary points where things break down in settlement processing and payment of uh, or withholding of taxes, where somehow the broker does not know the total year-to-date taxes paid, and they end up over collecting on Social Security and Medicare, which have thresholds or under collecting on the Medicare supplemental. So getting that uh, accurate year-to-date payment information into the broker system so the proper amount of tax withholding is, is calculated is, is really critical. The central control system can help do that. On the uh, on the lower left side, the other key area where risk happens is um, on the demographics. And you know, almost all the time there's some late HR uh, termination or perhaps a fat finger or something where they're putting in the wrong information about the employee location. And that data passes on to the broker that's what they're going to use for tax withholding. And if that's incorrect, you've got a mess on your hands. So uh, making sure, we, again, we, rec we recommended putting a central control system in the place to actually collect that. We'll actually talk a little bit later on here about you know, where AI is starting to surface, where you can kind of detect that finger type errors coming from HR systems before they get passed on to the downstream uh, broker for, for settlement processing. So the, these central control systems are really important in terms of operating at scale and efficiently. And you can use things like AI to detect errors before they actually happen through pre-defect uh, detection. And, and so basically the central control system on the right side there is managing the collection of those key um, starting points and, and then ferreting that on to the record keeper to make sure that it's complete and accurate and you know, there's daily reconciliations between the two, uh, critical starting points. The second um, slide is the after state where there's actually a settlement happening. So there's a big RSU vesting about to happen or perhaps an executive's about to make a option exercise. In those cases, on the upper right side, as a settlement occurs, the information is collected and um, that, that the record keeper, the, the broker will send that information usually directly to the payroll teams. In this case, we've got the US payroll team receiving that settlement information from the record keeper. They may withhold taxes as specified and, um, and it's passed on to payroll and then payroll will process that particular uh, you know, um, income event and assign it to the employee and record the taxes being withheld. And, and typically the payroll systems will validate that themselves. What the central control system does is gather the information from the payroll system. It, it, it gathers the pay registers from the payroll system it gathers the record keeping uh, broker transaction and compares them side by side and identifies any differences between say state withholdings or federal or Medicaid withholdings and shows differences between them. This is really critical, especially on a, on a T plus one kind of issue and, and the IRS fines, you know, we wanna be able to identify where those gaps are almost immediately after the settlements happen so that you can correct the errors when they, when they occur and get them straightened out within the 24 hours or so that you have. 
Um, one of the things the central control system can do as well is highlight on the left side where there's lots of international payroll teams. They often handle their payroll independently and, and withhold the payroll taxes at the uh, at the foreign locations in those payroll jurisdictions. But um, we, we've often seen where we're not completely sure that the payroll team received the file and that they processed it completely. So the central control system can ensure that the file was delivered, that it was opened, and even request that the international payroll team indicate that they processed it. Uh, so there's lots of options that are ensure that completeness and accuracy of payment all the way down to a international payroll level. There's often treasury involved as well, where monies need to be wired from the U.S., from the taxes collected, all the way to the international payroll team to, to pay those international uh, tax withholdings. Um, on the lower left side, we're highlighting that there's workflow management here. This gets back to the purpose of reconciliation that we talked about earlier. Um, you know, one of the things we want, want to do is be able to identify errors when they occur, track those errors to completion, and hopefully identify the source of those errors and correct that source so they don't continue to recur. And so by putting a workflow management system in place, you're able to um, track it within the central control system instead of you know, what I've, I've often seen is that like an email chain spins up when an error is de you know, detected and you know, 25 emails later, it might be resolved and you really have lost tracking of it in the central control system, just know that, that it uh, existed. So if you'd like to see workflow management processes built into the central control system, and um, yeah, and then I think we're just highlighting the fact that end-to-end -end controls and reconciliations are in place for these systems. So let's see, Jolene, I'm probably getting behind on time. Uh, you are at, uh, I am behind on time, so you're gonna have to go fast. Uh, take it away with your demo. We're really excited about this. Hopefully it works. Um, showcase some of a uh, live tool here, Jolene. Great. And hopefully you're all seeing it in a different widget. There's still a presentation, but you can reconfigure your screen to make it a little bit bigger. But for example, this is a demo of one of those central control systems, which up front, there was a lot of work put into this. And it's a very custom built system for your company, for example. And a lot of that upfront work has to go with file definitions and business rules. The idea behind file definitions is that we're getting files from payroll and the broker we're interested in some columns, we're not interested in others, so we want to define those here. But one of the examples that we were talking about for the script was what if the broker comes back and says, oh, these columns are actually different, or we moved around some of the columns on the file. Well, we could easily edit the definition to say, all right, we're looking at these columns now, or exclude these columns. So there's not a lot of back-end code changes that are happening, you can do it all through the UI like this. We could also add new file definitions. Let's say that we start using a third-party tax vendor and we're trying to get information from them too. We could add this file definition in here. So it's very custom and it's built to what your needs are at that time. But there is a lot of upfront work that needs to go into what these definitions do look like. The other side of it is also business rules, the idea of, all right, we know that there are some issues Let's that's already known. Let's say for the broker side, sometimes there's a double amount of gross income and state tax in comparison to payroll. So that would be a business rule that we would want to define and say we are interested in looking at that. Maybe another business rule is we're always looking at state taxes for our mobility participants. So our state tax one variance business rule will be able to catch that and display that for us. But maybe a payroll expert comes in and says, well, I'm mostly interested in our larger variances because we know that there's probably a bigger root cause there. So we could edit this business rule as well to say, I only want to see any variances that are more than $100,000 off or et cetera. So again, it's very custom built to what you're looking for or what the payroll team might be looking for. And this is a culmination of a lot of work with all of the teams working together to figure out what do we want to see from this type of application. Then once you have all of these different definitions, 
we're ready to run the reconciliation job. So we could either import the files like we're all pretty familiar with, or maybe we set up an SFTP. So we want the software to automatically go and grab a file for us so we don't have to do that manually. We can set that up as well. And then once we have all of the files, we want to run the reconciliation job. So we could go and run that now, or we could schedule the job to run daily at about this time. So it will be ready for me either before lunch or after lunch maybe. So then we can dive right into the analysis of what's going on here. Once that job is run, we can come over to the summary and see these are all the business rules that we were interested in earlier. We wanted to see what is being affected by the state tax variance, which ends up being about 198 transactions, different transactions. So today I'm interested in looking at the transactions and their state one tax variances. So I can come to the transaction summary here and I can configure what I'm looking at. I can choose which columns I wanna see, the award IDs. I can look at information from the broker side, the differences between the federal taxations. And again, all of this logic was built in the back end because we've been working so hard with both the payroll and the equity teams to define what that logic does look like. I can also filter to say, I want this filter or these set of filters to always pop up for what I'm looking at with the differences between earnings and taxes. I could delete some of these, I could add a new filter. And then when I run this query, we'll be able to see all of the different transactions that hit any of those filters. I could also just export this to Excel or CSV so I can do my own analysis that way if I'm comfortable with that. But again, our example, we were looking at state taxes in particular. So I'm going to pick this one here with about a $9,000 tax difference. I can then drill into that to see what is coming in on the payroll side and what's coming in on the broker side. So everything else tax-wise, gross amount, earnings-wise is lining up except for our state one in California. We can see the broker is reporting more that $9,000 difference than the payroll side. At that point, we can go back to our payroll and equity teams, talk it out, figure out which side maybe needs a change or what happened with this particular issue and really drill down into that root cause analysis. This is a massive project to undertake as well. And there's a lot of different pros and cons that come with this. So I'll hand it back over to Matt and the presentation to talk about those. And sorry, hopefully you can all hear Matt. I don't think I can hear Matt. My fault. That's my fault. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, there we go. No worries. Uh, yes. Yeah, so thank you for saying that, Jillian. Um, on the purpose built side, this is really the culmination of uh, you know, our two and a half decades of experience building and managing equity record keeping platforms and dealing with some of the big pain points in it. So we're we really think there's a lot there that streamlines some of the manual efforts that people face. And uh, you know it's highly specialized, right? And it's very fast and it's automated. So as Jolene um, highlighted, these things could be ready in the morning. They could be ready as soon as the uh, payroll file is loaded, and out come the reconciliation differences. I think it's so powerful because uh, you know many of our people that we work with spend hours and hours performing reconciliations. If you could just imagine the ROI of having a lot of that time back, you know you don't have to let go of the reconciliation, but you. You can basically release some of the manual efforts and let the tools do the heavy lifting so that you can spend most of your mind share focused on why the error occurred 
resolving the error, chasing it back to the original source system, perhaps helping improve controls uh, uh, up front, you know, and maybe an HR process or something that's feeding data to the broker platform. And, and so it just allows the teams to be highly optimized to, to deliver quality products. And so what we've generally seen is when these kinds of platforms are built and, and put in place, uh, the, the, the head count it takes to manage an equity program it, it, the ratio, it, the number of heads it takes to manage it, the ratios are much, much smaller because the systems are doing so much on behalf of the people and the people become so much more effective. So that's a, that's a super big pro there. Um, you know, the costs are that, you know, there, there's some spend up front to build it, uh, of course, and it does require specialists and developers to, to build it, of course. You know, we, we feel pretty comfortable and have done this enough times that, uh, it, you know, we, we certainly can help streamline some of that heavy lift up front and do it efficiently and we've got you know code that can be leveraged and reused uh, and so you can start with a very good baseline but obviously it would be customized to your environment and um, you know that that would take time to get built and set up but once it's built it's there and it's running and it's in your environment uh, there are some level of effort for people to learn the new system but our experience has been time and time again because it's it's specifically built. We've gathered requirements from the users up front. We know exactly where the pain points are. Uh, it really just solves the pain points and no longer are there manual efforts and, and pain around the edges. They've built something that they love and use every day and it pleases them greatly. So uh, uh, that's, that's it for that. And so we'll move on to um, kind of just a little grid here. And, and you know, while we love the purpose-built application, it's not for everybody, we know that. Uh, spreadsheets, in fact, can work very well for most companies, especially ones in this kind of Gartner matrix that we've highlighted here. If the number of participants is somewhat reasonable, uh, maybe you have just an executive plan or you don't have a significant uh, number of employees, even if you do have a broad-based equity plan, uh, spreadsheets can be quite effective there. Um, and if your plan is straightforward, if you have just quarterly vesting of RSUs only, something along those lines, uh, spreadsheets are probably just great. Um, you just try and streamline some of the manual processes in it and, and use scripts and automate uh, like VBA and, and macros to improve those spreadsheets, they'll work well. I think as you move up the line where the participants start to get above 10,000, uh, maybe the plan complexity, you've got you know, lots of different uh, option types and you've got ISOs and you've got an acquisition to deal with, you've got multiple countries, uh, anything that creates complexity, multiple payrolls, uh, that's where scripts start to become more reasonable because you really need to streamline the manual processes and they, every every time you add a level of complexity, typically the manual processes increase. And so that's, as you're making decisions on what, what the right tool is for you, that, that's kind of the baseline that we use. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, as, as you get to be a, a fast growing company, highly acquisitive, um, super fast growth tracks, uh, lots and lots of countries or a long-term plan to be in many, many countries, uh, probably a purpose-built application may be more appropriate for you. And, and one of the things we always highlight in, in assessment processes is that you, you lay out the, the matrix of where the requirements are and one of these tools will fit, certainly. And uh, we'd love to help companies decide and, and evaluate that as a first step. All right, so uh, I think we'll also go into um, some features of the tool. We've got just a few minutes left here. Uh, I, I think I highlighted this earlier, AI, uh, we're spending lots of time with our technology teams investing in AI and how to integrate that into legacy equity processes. Of course, we have the generative AI solution around trouble ticketing and, and fast tracking answers for employees. But one of the more interesting things in tools like reconciliation tools is where AI can be used to uh, pre-identify errors, and there are really two ways to do that. You can use historical errors that you've had and let the AI flag transactions that are about to happen that look like historical errors. And the whole idea is here is to, to catch the error before it happens, right? So in, in, the, in the central control system, you can flag, you know, and, and maybe sign a percentage of likelihood of error to every single uh, best that's about to happen and, and flag it for review. And we have had direct experience where that can, that can quickly identify unusual anomalies like a uh, like an, a strange HR change in an employee's um, state location. It, that would pop out uh, probably in an unsupervised way. It would, it would be an outlier suddenly, and it would boil to the top of a ratio matrix that we put together that, that just says this is a high likelihood of, of, of a potential error. It ought to be reviewed. So we think this is a, the future of even streamlining processes more, uh, more effectively. Um, looking forward to that. 
Uh, once you have a central control system in place, there's lots of other automation that happens and, and can happen as the investment. You know, like we think of these tools as like a baseline and you can build on them. We've seen these tools be used to automate the journal entries, for instance, and uh, you know, change or move to multi-broker or handle FX uh, applications. And we've already talked about workflow management where we're tracing errors through JIRA ticketing and, and the likewise. Um, uh, additional areas of focus, mobility taxes, share pool reconciliations, working with transfer agents, working with your international payroll, all that's really helpful as well in this tool. Um, so I think we can just wrap here with uh, you know highlighting both my and Jolene's um, email addresses. We're always welcome and would love any questions that you have. I, I've got a number of questions that came through the Q&A. If you have any here, we can answer them if, if you like. I, I can spend just a few minutes on them. Um, one that came through was, are, does T plus one apply to RSU vestings? And if so, is that managed when selling over two or three days with special handling? I think there's special circumstances in some of these cases, but generally, yes, T plus one applies to all RSU vestings. So there may be special circumstances that you want to work with um, your advisors on, but um, yeah, you're, you're under the gun to get it done in T plus one. Um, the, another question came through, does $100,000 uh, rule apply per person or per company? I would say it's per company, so the combination of all your tax deposits. Uh, you may not have one individual having a $100,000 tax obligation, but if you have the sum of all your individuals with $100,000 tax obligation, you're obligated to get that done in, uh, in one day for, per the IRS rules. Um, yeah, and there were some questions about ADP Global View and payroll recon reports. There may be some recon reports with some of the payroll systems out there. I'm not sure what they would do. I don't think they would do what we're talking about, where you're taking the original source system um, information from the broker and comparing it to what the payroll team processed, but perhaps. And, and we always recommend, especially as part of an assessment process, to consider what's available today. You know, why reinvent the wheel if there is something good that, that's out there and works? Many of these packages do have pretty capable function sets, and, and that's a key factor to look at. Um, and then the final question was around Python and R and other open source packages, and if there, uh, if there are any concerns about them being open source. And I would say um, not particularly. I think most companies, uh, we work some of the largest, and they're using Python today. I don't think that it's open source is a, a major concern, but you do want to make sure that you in, you know, because you're going to be processing very sensitive payroll and a sensitive PII type of data, it needs to be controlled within your corporate environment in a very significant, tight, controlled way. So working closely with your IT teams to make sure that uh, that's set up properly is key. Um, See, so I think we have one more question. Anything else? Um, okay, yeah, T plus one applies on what day in May? I bet many of us uh, know this by heart by now, but I think it's 528. And uh, yeah, so just a few uh, weeks away and um, best of luck with all that. I, I think many of the brokers have gotten their um, processes as, as tight as they can, but a lot will still rest on you as companies to, um, to, to leverage what the brokers recommend and have your own sets of controls like these reconciliations to make sure they work well. Okay, with that, I really appreciate the time today. Thank you for joining us. And uh, there will be a recording of this if you want to watch it again or share with others and uh, look for some follow-up. And Chad, back to you. I think there's a survey, right? Thank you, Matt and Jolene, for a great presentation today. Um, if we didn't have time to answer your questions, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. And like Matt said, we will be sending out a recording of this webcast to you in the next day or so. Um, here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. And thank you again for joining us today, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you all.